Hey, Michelle. Hey, Kate. Do you ever have trouble getting your students to like writing? Oh, goodness gracious, never. Uh, of course I do. Of course I do. Okay, all right. Well, I've got a really good idea I want to share with you. Okay, what is it? All right, so I was thinking, my reluctant writers, I'm going to have them write a hundred times. I will enjoy writing in Mr. Summers' class. You think that'll work? <laughs> no, you are not going to do that. I'll come over. We will brainstorm and figure this out. <sighs> Welcome to Across the Hall, a podcast sharing ELA strategies from one door away with your hosts, Cade Summers and Michelle Shelton. This is Episode 7, Revving Up Writing. Hey, guys. Hey, y'all. Hey, in this episode of Across the Hall, Episode 7, by the way, that's uh, pretty pretty cool, isn't it, Michelle? It's absolutely cool. Number 7. We have with us Angela Stockman. Uh, we're glad she's agreed to interview with us. She is the author of a book called Make Writing. And it's really neat because of the fact that uh, we recently have had an episode with Dan Ryder on the idea of makerspaces and how to incorporate our ELA classrooms into makerspaces. Well, she is going to just take this one step farther. Uh, And farther, further? Further? Further. One step further. So in that episode, hopefully you're able to learn a little bit about how to make your writing curriculum and your instruction of writing in whatever class that you teach more productive and more enjoyable. And then in our second segment, we'll be talking about how Kate and I have been using some of these strategies in our classrooms and um, the experience that we've been having with writing here in the first few weeks of school. Our third and final segment, as usual, is going to be hashtag the struggle. And you'll get to learn a little bit more about the things that Michelle and I struggle with Uh, when our boots are on the ground, so to speak. So let's go ahead and get started. Angela, just to tell everybody a little bit about you, uh, feel free to describe um, the process by which you uh, eventually wrote the book, uh, how how that came to be, as well as uh, your shift from traditional writing instruction to the make writing format. All right. So, About 10 years ago, I started a writing community for writers and teachers. We had kids coming as young as five, um, all the way through senior year of high school, and even some college students still hung around with us. And the cool thing about this writing community was that teachers from different school districts were invited to come um, and kind of do lesson study in the context of writers workshops. So kids were coming from different schools and teachers were coming from different schools and the learning that we were doing there kind of, it really complemented what we were doing Monday through Friday on the ground inside of the schools. Uh, Teachers were able to study what great writing was and how different people approached teaching writing. Um, And they were able to kind of bat ideas around and talk with one another and problem solve and brainstorm together. And I was able Um, to really keep myself rooted in the work of young writers after I left the classroom. I taught for a long time at the middle school and high school levels. I started my career actually at the elementary level too, but I spent less time there. Um, And when I left the classroom about 12 years into my career, I became a staff developer. Um, And a lot of the work that I was doing was around writers workshop, traditional writers workshop, which I'm very passionate about and I still am. But one of the things that people kept requesting over and over and over again was an opportunity for this lab classroom experience. Like, let's let's stop pretending that we know everything there is to know about how to teach writing well. And wouldn't it be really great if, in a very low-risk environment, we could just admit we don't know, position ourselves as learners, and study what kids do? Um, So... We were outside of the school system. We were this mixed group. It was kind of this grassrootsy sort of thing. And it was a profound opportunity to really learn from kids. And that's what the book grew out of, my own learning community that I was a part of at the time. Um, One of the commitments that we made was to really seek understanding around things, um, gather evidence of, of our learning, and disseminate our findings, give them back to the field. And that was really what motivated my first action research project. I was interested in the shift that some kids might make um, from defining themselves as resistant writers or kids who really disliked writing 
to kids who loved writing and could produce high quality writing. What I wanted to study was what was happening in between. Um, and so for a number of years, I documented learning that kids were making visible inside of my writer's studio. I also did the same thing inside of the schools that I was coaching in because I do staff development Monday through Friday in various forms in English language arts classrooms. Um, and so I took a lot of pictures and I took a lot of video and I interviewed a ton of kids and I really tried to stay um, rooted in an I don't know mentality. What might take a resistant writer and inspire them? And this was about 10 years ago when I started looking at all of that qualitative data. Um, there were things that kind of struck me and trends that emerged in the pictures, in the video. Um, when I would interview kids, they were standing up, they were moving around, they were building things and making things, and they were telling stories and making arguments and creating poems and um, creating all sorts of informational sorts of pieces, but they weren't necessarily using print as their primary modality. They were doing this by building things with loose parts or acting out skits or filming things or making a puppet show or creating a game. Um, there were kids who were knitting and sewing and cooking and um, the invitations inside of my writer's studio expanded in response to these other activities that they were interested in. And my primary motivation was just to try and figure out what do kids like to do other than writing? Let them do that stuff here and then see if we can make some sort of connection to writing. And so that's really what motivated Make Writing is that I took all of my findings from that pretty extensive action research project that was built around the question, what's happening when resistant writers suddenly show some interest in writing and actually start to create good writing. And, you know, that project motivated the book. There were a number of findings that came out of it. Um, one was that making can be an, uh, a catalyst for writing or a gateway to writing. So if kids really enjoy cooking, inviting them to write things that help them share their love of cooking with others is a really a uh, profound way to hook kids who might be a little bit more resistant. So having them blog recipes or create some sort of podcast and they have to create the text for it. Another pretty significant finding though was that when we treat writing as making, we're able to engage those kids who do not prefer to sit still and type on a, a, a computer or use flat static drafts, or especially um, blocky graphic organizers that are all on one page. And so at the same time, I was reading all, um, Austin Kleon's work, which is amazing, um, and getting a sense of you know, his primary premise is that we need to use our hands. And he writes using index cards. And so I bought copies of Steel Like an Artist for the kids at studio, and we did a book study around it. And they started using index cards and post-it notes and showing me how they were breaking form into blocks and kind of processing block by block rather than draft by draft. So rather than moving kids through an entire rough draft, what would happen if we thought about what the blocks of the draft were first? So very basic story structure might be somebody wanted but so then. Somebody wanted something, but there's a problem. So they go through all sorts of um, different attempts to resolve that problem before they're finally able to. What if we just had kids write about their somebody and we process, we move through the whole writing process, brainstorming, ideation, let them play around with different ways to create that character, give them lots of feedback and let them revise that piece and make it better before they move on to the second block of their draft. The other thing is that when we have them draw their somebody wanted but so then, build me your somebody wanted but so then, they often will start to add more detail to their builds that can then become words, um, labels that we stretch out and, and add to their drafts as well. So this was building stamina for the kids who really needed it because they were able to really do what Anne Lamott says. And I, I tweeted something um, that, that she 
uh, is so well known for saying, she talks about the, the power of short assignments and the one inch picture frame and how she keeps one on her desk. Well, a two by two post-it note for me, it reminds me of that one inch picture frame. So one of the big takeaways for me is that if we let kids ideate using post-it notes instead of graphic organizers, they're movable, they're mixable. Kids will experiment more, they'll brainstorm deeper, they'll be more selective. Um, they'll have more to choose from instead of just filling out a graphic organizer. That one inch picture frame sort of mentality or metaphor too, it makes writing manageable for kids who are particularly print resistant. And I'm also finding that it addresses another issue that's huge. There are kids today who are print comfortable and because they're print comfortable, they live under a delusion that it's enough to pound out a perfect five paragraph essay that if they're really great writers in terms of using print, they're really great writers and they're not. Great writers today, they know how to use social media for marketing purposes. They know how to drop great infographics into their pieces. They know that writing a blog post is very different than writing a book and they know how to use visuals and they know how to integrate multiple forms of media to communicate a message. Oftentimes, like the kids that I meet who are print resistant, they are awesome at all of that other stuff. And the kids who are really print comfortable, they have this false confidence that isn't going to serve them well in the long run. So that was another big sort of connection that maybe we need to separate the form, like narrative writing, from the modality, which could be something along the lines of, I'm going to build you a story. Um, and my modality is maybe be going to be puppetry, or my modality might be um, sewing. I saw an exhibit. Um, two weekends ago in Atlanta at um, the Museum of Design Atlanta, uh, where an artist um, actually storyboarded using um, some very fine handiwork in terms of, of sewing, and, and she was able to illustrate different parts of the story using a medium that was completely different from print. These are the directions that I think most future conscious writers are going in. Um, and I think that we're shortchanging kids when we don't separate form um, from medium and modality inside of writers' workshops. So all of these discoveries were kind of what came out of my action research. They were the impetus behind make writing, although um, make writing is, is an old manuscript at this point. And so there's been a lot more that I've learned and I'm looking forward to sharing a lot of that uh, in the new year too. Yeah. Um, throughout your book, you talk a lot about tinkering, and you, you've mentioned some things that I'm sure fall under tinkering. Um, cool. What does that look like as students are creating an argument? If students are creating an argument, one of the best things that they can do is start to gather evidence from multiple credible sources to support a claim. And so they might come back to the table with a stack of index cards or post-it notes. If they put one bit of evidence on every single post-it note or one bit of evidence on every single index card and they are scouring diverse resources to support their claim, what they're gonna come back with is a wide collection of these notes that are an individual card. I like to have them cluster different ideas from different sources together. And when they move these ideas together and they cluster maybe these five notes look like, when I connect these five ideas together, they change my argument in, in a small way or they add nuance to my perspective um, in another way. And it's one thing to cluster the details that we're finding, but the next thing is to recluster them and mix them. So I could put these four ideas together, or I could put these three ideas together. And when I move this one over here, it really makes me think of something different. That is tinkering in much the same way that we play with the lump of clay. We are shaping it, molding it, snapping it in half, putting it back together, fussing around with it until we get a sense of what's ideal or what is most satisfying, and then we choose that. Kids will also tinker by, I will have kids lift just the hook um of, of a piece out of, of of out of their drafts and we'll maybe explore five or six different ways other writers have created a hook for their piece and i'll say experiment with your own hook rewrite it five or six different ways 
before you decide on the way that's best. And make sure you get feedback from other people too. So tinkering in writing is when we create an experience that is very similar to when we ask kids to tinker with two with, with a handful of Legos, um, where they're snapping things together and pulling them apart again and getting a sense of what's most satisfying, what's best. Uh, before they're choosing. And in order to do that, they have to work with bits of text, not the whole draft, because you don't tinker with an entire draft, you're only tinkering with small pieces. Uh, and so that's kind of how I describe it. It's really about mixing and remixing and experimenting to gain gra greater satisfaction before we decide which revision is going to go back into our draft. Um, I have been working on something with my students that involves a lot of choice on their part and sometimes when I give them too much choice too much yeah. they get very overwhelmed and kind of just shut down what have you seen in your experience with that when it comes because you, you've listed a lot of different kinds of ways that they create stories in, that in my classroom and, and what my students might do with that the learning target is your greatest friend and so I'm really clear in my own work and you know, to be fair, my work is pretty experimental. So I'm not suggesting that this is the way to do it. I'm suggesting that this is one way to think about it because we do have to control for quality. It, I always say that if making in the writing classroom is not elevating the writing and it's not elevating the writer, it's not well placed there because our responsibility is to build better writers. Right. And so we want to create situations where we have control over the quality of what kids are producing and their experience and their learning. We want it to be um, impressive and we want it to be something that they recognize as well. Otherwise, their confidence doesn't get built. So when they're struggling, they feel that and we're, we're kind of working against ourselves. Can, and Dan Ryder talks a lot about constraints and so does Amy Verval in their book. Um, I find that the learning target is huge. First, I control for our quality by making the choice around the form that we're pursuing together. We're all going to write arguments, but you get to choose what the um, subject of your argument is going to be, what your topic's going to be. We're all going to write arguments, um, but we're going to work on them bit by bit, and I'm going to help you experiment and tinker with each piece of your argument as you go. And you're going to have a lot of choice around the direction that you move in. Finally, a, a big direction that I'm moving in right now is thinking about we're all going to write arguments, but your final form might not have to take the form of print. Maybe your argument is going to be a soliloquy. Maybe your argument is going to be a public service announcement. Maybe your argument is going to be a post that you put on Facebook um, where you are challenging someone's thinking about something. So that final form is a place where kids can have um, a lot of choice as well, especially if I'm assessing their writing throughout the process. If I'm assessing each block of that argument writing experience bit by bit throughout the process, if I know that they're capable of making a solid claim, if they're capable of finding evidence to support it, if I've watched them attack the counterclaim um, and challenge that counterclaim in a way that's really sophisticated, and they want to take everything that they've learned and make a public service announcement that's going to convince someone other than me to do or not do something, that is a far more valuable use of their time than making them sit down and pound out some really antiquated drafts and I'm gonna be the only one who sees it. So I control form, I know what the target is and what I'm assessing for, and if those are the pieces that I'm playing with, uh, then they can have a lot of choice around medium, modality, how they choose to build each part of their argument. It gives them a lot more uh, license, I think. Um, so one of the things, this is probably in, in the process that you're describing so far, it's, it probably uh, started uh, at the beginning of a school year, but um, continues throughout the year. I noticed that in your text, you emphasize a lot about a culture of collaboration and in what you're describing right now, um, I get at times almost burnt out because uh, I, try, I still try to do way too much as a teacher. I try to bounce around the room, student to student, and I feel like there's tons of lost time because some students are so heavily dependent on me and not a peer or not even their own 
thought processes that they'll uh, virtually do very little or nothing until I can get to them and offer that one-on-one -on -one help. How does, um, how do some of your strategies help alleviate that issue or resolve that issue? One of the things that I always recommend is that teachers keep um, a chart in their room and make it very clear to kids what they need to be working on until you can get to them. I also think it's really important to have them start self-assessing very early in the year, the first week of school. Are you able to keep working until I get to you? Or are you totally stuck and you can't move forward unless I help you? And that also requires me to sort of take what they're doing and make examples of them sometimes, not in a critical way, but to, to kind of unpack the decision that they've made for the class. Because they have a really difficult time distinguishing between when I'm totally stuck and I need the teacher and when I really could have kept this moving forward in some way until the teacher was able to come and peek over my shoulder and give me a little bit of support. So a chart can help um, what to do while you're waiting. And usually I will let kids, I will tell kids to build the things that they don't have words for, build the problem that they're facing or the challenge that they're facing, um, build something that's compelling them if they're stuck, if they're blocked, because usually the, the build will inspire some sort of an idea that will help them move them forward. Um, I will also have them go back and tinker with a different part of their draft that they're feeling totally comfortable with or confident in. And I also believe in giving kids really solid um, tools to help them assess the quality of their writing, not just rubrics that we use for evaluation, but um, I really prefer giving kids tools that define the six, what a lot of people refer to as the six traits of writing. And so what does idea development look like? Organization, word choice, sentence fluency, voice, these things, when we study them one element at a time, and if kids are given very specific criteria for what they look like in writing, these become powerful tools that allow them to do a bit of self-assessment. I also think the more that we use mentor texts and give kids access to the work of other writers and have them investigate that and get really immersed in it before they produce it themselves, uh, the less likely they are to get stuck or to not know what their options are um, as they're moving forward. So I think we really need to arm them with a lot of tools that they can kind of lean on while they're waiting for teachers to come and check in with them. But I also think we need to do a good job over the course of the year of helping kids identify, you know, you really do have the tools at your disposal to make some decisions and move yourself forward here. Um, you don't always have to rely on me. I honestly think that this is why we need to support peer review in a much better way in most classrooms. Kids don't do a good job with it. And so we give up and we say they can't do it. But I honestly think that if we can teach peer review and coach peer review bit by bit and scaffold them to more and more sophisticated practices over the course of the year and even check in with them at the end of every peer review session. How well did peer review go today and how can we make it better next time? They're usually very honest and if we pitch our lessons around the things that they're saying didn't go well, um, usually they get better at peer review and the better they get at assessing someone else's work, the more um, inclined they are to do a good job with their own too. So all of those tools and peer review and really coaching reflection and some metacognitive uh, work around writing, it helps a lot. Where does curriculum fit in or how do you, I know you have one of the hacks about standardization, the use of standards and how that fits in to make writing and maybe we could get you to uh, discuss that a little bit. So I think our previous conversation creates a bit of a foundation for this one. When we're talking about what should the teacher, the writing teacher control for in order to ensure that we move writers and writing forward. I truly believe that form is something that we need to be able to teach to the whole group. Um, I came through my own teacher certification process at a time where workshop was not built around units. Workshop was every kid can write whatever they want at the same time. And I really struggled with that because it's very difficult. Teaching writing is challenging stuff. Mm -hmm. Teaching writing 
to a room full of 25 kids who are all writing different things at the same time, it's really hard to get your bearings and to be able to teach solid lessons. Um, and to be able to give kids, I think, uh, the level of, of, you know, information and detail that they need around form and craft and process in a coherent way in order to move them forward. So I believe very strongly in framing units um, around form and that we will all write story at the same time. We will all write um, argument at the same time, but giving them a lot of choice around topics and giving them a lot of choice in terms of their even their final form and what that final project will look like and switching up medium and modality. Um, I also believe very strongly in creating a unified uh, and coherent pathway through the year around something that really matters. And so a lot of the schools that I'm supporting this year were very interested in pursuing social justice issues, for instance. And so they're framing an entire year around, you know, what do our leaders need to hear right now? And so they're writing small moments around social justice, you know, small moments of that, that a small moment in my life that called for a social justice. They're doing research around how to handle controversy in the classroom um, for, and they're doing information pieces around what that looks like. Then they're getting ready to make an argument and the argument is based on what they learned in the first unit and the second unit and the third unit is where they're going to execute this argument and their fourth unit for the year and their final one um, is an opportunity for them to amplify that argument beyond their intended audience and, and into the world. And so there's a unifying purpose for why we're writing together this year. The challenge is to determine a unifying purpose based on the needs and interests of everyone in the room, not just the teacher. And I'm still playing a lot with this right now, but where my work has taken me in the last couple of years is around emergent curriculum design processes. So instead of purchasing a curriculum from a vendor or designing a curriculum in a bubble over the summer with a team of teachers, how can we begin to create curriculum using a design thinking approach? How can we begin to frame out a curriculum that is responsive to the needs and interests of our kids in real time. What pieces of it, and, I, and I'm starting to think of agile frameworks for curriculum design. I'm not suggesting that teachers just throw curriculum out the window and not have any hand in it at all and not pre-plan. But what I'm suggesting is what structure needs to be in place? What framework needs to be in place at the start of the year? And where can kids start to rough it in? and where can their voice start to have a lot of impact on the curriculum um, as we're moving forward. And so these are the things that I'm playing with and I'm starting to blog a lot of that process um, and I plan to share a lot of it on my blog over the next month. But I really think in terms of curriculum, we need to get a lot clearer around what we should have control over and what we should be releasing control of and how we can begin to co-design curriculum with students in a way that still ensures quality and still moves kids forward, but makes them a co-collaborator in the process. That's the stuff that's really exciting me right now. That, that is so powerful. That it sounds so exciting to me as well. A group of teachers went to Columbus, Ohio for the Teach to Lead Summit. It's uh, yeah. annual. And just earlier this year, uh, we had a group of teachers who went up there with an idea and while we were there, we came across uh, Neil Gupta, who actually mm -hmm. spoke at that conference. He was seated at a table, and to us, he's like a rock star, you know, at least uh, on, on, in the Twitter sphere. And I went over and introduced myself, and I said, you have got to take a picture with me and, uh, you know, and tell me and, and tweet that, you know, you finally got to meet me as opposed to <laughs> the other way around. And so I got to rub that into our principal. But what one thing Neil... Uh, told us about in about a 30 minute conversation uh, had to do with that concept of uh, at the beginning of a, a year, they had a specific school that they were kind of experimenting with where uh, all, virtually like the first three days, it was a matter of taking a pool of kids and sit and figuring out which classrooms they belonged in um, or which spaces they needed to be in. And then from there, then it, it transpired into uh, more, decision-making about curriculum like you're describing and 
anyway, it's just a convergence of different ideas. Like what even recently Dan Ryder had said uh, was were some things about uh, on day one and the way that he'll have students organize the furniture to yeah. discussing interests and things like that. Yeah. When I designed my writer's studio, um, for a long time we met on a college campus, our writing community, and then as we evolved and grew, I found a space for us um, that was our own. It was a storefront, and the way that we designed the space was I held a surprise party for our birthday, and I invited all the kids to come to this address, um, and I bought a cake, and we made lots of food, but the space was empty, and I covered the place with flip chart paper, and I said to them, this is your writer's studio. What do you want to do with it? And I gave them lots of magazines and catalogs and furniture design, you know, a lot of, of supply and, and furniture catalogs and um, Pinterest boards they created and they really built vision boards for how the space um, could could meet their needs best. And of course, I still had my own vision about certain things too, but I, I really think that what emerged from that process was the creation of an environment that really had their fingerprint on it. Um, and that meant a lot to me. And I know that that space was something that they felt they created, not something that I just gave them. Have you been able to uh, locate a school that has had like continuous grade by grade facilitation of the make writing strategies for maybe like a consecutive two or three or four years and been able to track any of those types of kids to see the differences yet or? Not yet. What I'm spending most of my weekdays doing right now is traveling to different schools and helping them get a curriculum um, in place, a framework for it. And I'm also supporting a lot of teachers who are just beginning to do these things in their classrooms. Uh, so we, I don't know of a school district that has done it um, across multiple grade levels, not consistently enough where they're in a place you know, to study it at this point. I'm still working with, and I, and I think a lot of people are, um, I think that we're coming around the bend from a really rough standards implementation period, and in my state at least, and I know in other places as well, um, where people scrapped writing entirely in some cases, um, and they got rid of workshop, and they're just starting to come back to even having kids do authentic writing because most of the writing that they were doing was either on-demand stuff or it was writing in response to things that they read. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not a well-balanced approach to teaching writing, and it doesn't build better writers. So a lot of the work that I'm doing, and it looks different in every single system I'm in, um, there are some systems where teachers are really still in a place where we've never, we haven't taught writing in many years in the way that you're describing. There are some systems that have been teaching writing for a long time. Um, and would be really resistant to me coming in and saying, let's make writing and, you know, throw a bunch of confetti around and have a lot of fun. That would not go so well. But what is happening is we're looking at a student work and we're identifying which hate writing and I'm giving them the strategy to try as interventions. Um, and so try it this way. Instead of using your graphic organizer, let's try using some index cards. Instead of doing that brainstorming activity, let's try some affinity mapping first. Um, and I'm sort of applying strategies uh, in a just right way and in a just in time way uh, to help move writers forward. And then I have some very progressive schools that have a lot of support from administrators and who get where we kind of want to go um, that are inviting me in to start more robust conversations and work. But it's a beginning. It's definitely not something that's been in place for a couple of years. It would, um, so for those teachers who say, you know, kind of say, I don't know how this is supposed to help them in college or how is this going to help them on the AP exam? Um, what would you say to them? Uh, usually I use examples from our high school writers that I've worked with before and typically it requires very precise planning and work with those teachers. I can't stand on a stage or at the front of the room and give a keynote or do some two-hour workshop on all of this cool stuff that you can do to integrate making with writing. What I have to do is sit with teachers and say let's tear apart this AP exam. And let's talk about what the blocks are of this particular type of an exam. And let's talk about where 
um, some of these strategies might be of the most use and which ones really aren't going to be relevant at all because everything doesn't fit with every sort of task for sure. But what I will tell you is this, when it comes to having high school kids do research, um, the affinity mapping process that we use far more valuable um, than any graphic organizer I've ever had kids use before and their ability to synthesize that information um, is off the chart. So I, I think that I have to contextualize it. I have to be able to sit with teachers and really work beside them elbow to elbow um, and, and brainstorm and kind of really tease out what are the specific struggles that your students are facing and then what are the specific interventions that you might try to move them forward? And that's usually how it's framed. If a teacher's coming at me with that level of skepticism, that's a very healthy thing and that's fine. I need to kind of honor the skeptic in the teacher and the fact that that teacher has been working in this, this capacity with these particular kids far longer than I have. My job is to practice empathy and to um, share options um with teachers and and keep working until we find something that's satisfying for them it's not to come in with some silver bullet and say this is the way to go i don't convince anybody of anything i just share some different ideas and strategies and i know which ones now uh tend to be most appreciated because we've been testing them a little bit longer now all right if schools wanted to reach out to you or if people wanted to follow you how might they follow you well everything i've tried to build everything online around my name so that i'm easy to find so on twitter my handle is at angela stockman just my name my uh, email address is my last name stockman angela at gmail.com and my website is um, www.angelastockman.com so is there anything that you are getting asked here recently that uh that might be beneficial to our audience that we haven't really hit on? Well, a lot of people are starting to approach, you know, when I published Make Writing, it was research findings that came out of that action research I did at Studio. And what was really striking to me was a lot of what resistant writers were doing looked a lot like what was coming out of the maker movement. And when I started my research, the maker movement was kind of like not even a breath on the wind at that point. It was 10 years ago. Um, and the maker movement was just gaining strength in, in the general, you know, global atmosphere and not really in schools at that time. So when people started publishing around this, I was saying to, to my colleagues and friends, my gosh, this looks just like the findings that are coming out of studio, out of the action research project. It's bigger than that, though. And so a lot of the conversations that people are, trying, are having with me now and where I'm feeling a lot of inspiration is around this integration between design thinking and the writing process. Um, and conversations around, is there a relationship between design? And I really find that there is potential for design thinking to actually elevate the writing process because design is driven by empathy. And we teach kids to be incredibly self-centered writers. We teach them to pick topics that interest them. And we teach them to write about what they know. When we look at the work of empathy, and we look at ethnographic strategies that people are using to come to know and understand other people and advocate for them, or at least write things that are aligned to their interests and needs. Empathy has the potential to do some pretty powerful stuff inside of the writing process and to help kids write things that will really make them of influence in the world. I also think that the more that we can treat drafting like prototyping, um, the more inventive kids' work will be and the better it will be, too, because they rush through that writing. We teach that writing process all too often, even when we don't intend to, it looks linear. And it feels like this straight march through a certain steps to a finished product. Um, and I know that people, you know, fall into the trap of treating design in the same way, but I really, I'm really interested in the integration between the two and how design can serve writers in writing. That, that's exciting to me. So if I had anything to offer in terms of where to look next, that would be it. I'm interested to find out a little bit more. You mentioned how that your work and Mark Barnes's work were kind of contemporary to one another, uh, how that the make writing ideas were evolving at the same time as the makerspace notions. Tell us a little bit more about that. The action research around it started about 10 years ago. And then um, Mark had launched the Hack Learning Series 
and I was blogging for him at the time and he asked um, if I would be interested in publishing around the writing piece and I said you know I'm thinking well I have all of this data and all of this evidence for my action research um, but it was loose at the time and make writing I feel like uh, there's been so much more that I've learned since then too um, I saw a little bit of a hint on Twitter that you might be working on another book Oh yeah, I have a new book coming out in early 2018 um, called Hacking Writing Workshop. Uh, and it is about redesigning the writer's workshop and creating more future ready writer's workshop. It's that integration of the design thinking piece and kind of where I wanted to go next because it's bigger than the making. It's almost like uh, the making is evidence of design, but it might not be the heart of what I'm learning. Well, that's, that's exciting. I will definitely be reading that book as well. Then, all right. Well, um, we have uh, Angela Stockman, author of Make Writing, Five Teaching Strategies That Turn Writer's Workshop into a Makerspace. And Angela, we are so grateful you've taken time so uh, you to us to, uh, <laughs> to participate in our podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you for what you do. This is awesome. Have a good night, guys. All right, so Angela had tons of things to offer, different strategies and tips for us ELA teachers to try to make writing in our classroom different. What exactly did you like about what Angela had to say, Michelle? Well, one thing that I really like about the whole make, make writing process, which is a huge part of it, is the tinkering. Um, the kids playing around with their writing, which is kind of a new thing to me. I think the concept of it isn't incredibly new because we talk about getting them to, you know, move your sentences around, change your paragraphs, let's put this word here. But as far as them physically picking up pieces of paper, sticky notes, and moving them is definitely something that I um, had not done before. Yeah, there's something in her book about using Legos for the same concept of having this, for example, she gives anecdotally the student named Luke, I think, and says that he really struggled at putting things together when it came to writing, um, but when it came to uh, using his hands, he loved Legos, and this was a young child, and so she incorporated Legos in writing and started writing words on the Legos, and um, from that point forward, the kid was able to start putting together the words into sentences and sentences into paragraphs and uh, have a complete uh, product that, uh, that he created that all started with Legos. I thought that's pretty interesting. So one of the things that she said in our interview was rather than having students write a draft and then look back at a draft when they're doing peer editing and revisions, have students write in blocks. Have you tried that lately? I think you have been doing something uh, along those lines, right? I've, I've done something um, similar. I don't know that... Uh... Uh, uh, probably more along the lines of the tinkering than the writing in blocks because I think with the writing in blocks did she say that that's where you kind of zoom in on like just the introduction and we're just going to focus on this introduction mm -hmm. did I understand that correctly yeah okay so what we've been doing in my class is they have been building their blog post before they actually type it so I gave them slips of paper um, we called them cards even though I just cut up some white paper and passed out 10 to each student to begin with and they had to write information that they thought their audience um, would need to know in order to talk about how millennials struggle with communication and building relationships. So we watched a video and they were able to do some research and even to use their own experiences and they had to put an idea on each card and then they could go back and research that if they needed to. But anyway, so um, on the first day they p built it with their information on the paper and I did not let them type at all until they were finished building it with their paper. And then um, the next day I gave them some more cards and that, that was for them to think specifically about their title, to think about what pictures they might put in there, what quotes they might pull out. Um, and we really focused on their audience and what their audience would need to know, what title would grab their audience. And so they, they built it and then they were able to top their blog to look like the one that they had built with their paper. Yeah, and I've gotten to see some of these. You've shared with me three, four, or five by now different links to some of your students' blogs, and I'm really impressed. Actually, what Michelle has done is she's shown me some along the process of these students' writing, and initially what students had created was short, was not very well-developed, 
but over time with continued tinkering, presumably, Mm -hmm. I guess, uh, with continued tinkering over time, these students' works have really developed and they have uh, clearly uh, an audience in mind and they are relating to one another. And I like the topic uh, with the millennials anyway, because it almost, I perceive each of these as almost uh, giving lessons to each other. They're kind of teaching each other. They are. Almost how to improve their their uh, lives. Am I right? You, you are. And it, it was funny to hear them talk about millennials in such a negative way when they are millennials. <laughs> They're like, you're right. We don't really talk to each other. Um, so they were able to give advice to themselves, basically. Uh, but we were doing this in conjunction with Fahrenheit 451. It wasn't just something I threw out at them. But we, we were noticing that the society in Fahrenheit 451, that futuristic society, actually had some similarities to our own. And that was one of them, is that technology has kind of taken over and kept them from being able to really communicate well. So about how many cards does each student have? They probably ended up with about 15 and so what I was just really impressed with, and, and you mentioned that, is the the progression. Because the the blog post that they did before this on the Scarlet Ibis, I modeled for them and showed them several of my blog posts and what blog posts look like. And then just, you know, gave them their assignment. And I got a paragraph with no pictures. Or if there was a picture, it was one stuck at the bottom awkwardly. Um, and seeing that in comparison to what they created after tinkering... I mean, there there really is no comparison. It was complete transformation from one to the other. And I showed them that and bragged on them for the amount of transformation that went into that blog post. So I've been very, very pleased with, with the results. Last year, I had my students start blogging for the first time. My first experiment was in the second semester of last school year. And I haven't had this year's students begin blogging yet. I've started creating some of their blogs. They've started choosing themes for their blogs, but they have not actually uh, produced their first post. We're getting there. And one of the things that I'm trying to do uh, in uh, response to the interview with Angela is uh, my students are reading two different texts, um, one for choice, two also for Lexile level or grade level reading ability. And so I have in the same classroom students reading Warriors Don't Cry, which is a nonfiction memoir by Melba Patillo Beals about the integration um, in 1957 of the Little Rock City School named Central High School. And the other students are reading Lord of the Flies. And just recently, because of the fact primarily that Lord of the Flies is so symbol heavy and Mm -hmm. symbol driven, um, Golding obviously wanted to convey a lot of the thematic material and a lot of that message through the use of various symbols in addition to the fact that he uses lightness and darkness and colors and so on symbolically as well. I got to thinking, well, in our class discussion and in the way that we converge in ideas, we need to really concentrate on symbols. So it was an extra push for my Warriors Don't Cry folks to find uh, potential symbols in uh, Beals' text. Obviously a nonfiction, it would have been far more overt if if uh, if I wanted them to see um, symbols that she intentionally placed there. So they're not really there, but there are in the sense of like the intentionality of bills in a nonfiction text as compared to Golding. But the symbols really are there. Mm-hmm. You have the, the school itself is compared to a museum, not a really grand museum, but the coldness of a museum where you kind of wander around and you feel lost. It's also compared to a, a castle, but not a castle that you would dream of, of wandering around in or living in, but a castle that is so immense that you cannot ever find your way out of it. So it mm. almost becomes prison-like. And so there, there are some very obvious connections to symbolic ideas in her text. So where am I? Basically, I had my students write on five cards, um, symbols, and then secondly, what they believe the symbol represents. Um, in other words, for example, if you're looking at Lord of the Flies, the conch shell re- reflects or represents the idea of power or authority, or uh, the glasses of Piggy represents his superior insight or intellect. And then in Beals's text, they also did the same thing. The symbol of the school represents, uh, represents a prison or represents freedom. Uh, and it ironically could be either one. You could uh, look at 
a variety of other things, whether it's uh, the people themselves, uh, the white faces could represent something, constant antagonism in that, in, in that text, and so on. So secondly is what it represents. Thirdly, they have to cite text evidence on that card for that symbol uh, that they have selected or identified in that text. So my next step that they're doing this week is they're going to divvy up these. We're gonna, I will divvy up the cards, and each student will have about three cards. They each came up with five symbols. Um, actually, we could do it five cards if, if indeed I have all my students who have produced that much. But I have a few students who I've made accommodations for. So, so it'll be three to five cards. And each one will have cards that was not his or her own. And kind of like what Angela had said in the interview... Um, where you, if you're in the process of writing, you can like rearrange some of the cards and uh, buy, and put them with a certain group, group them in certain ways, and then and then regroup them with other cards, and how that it conveys a completely different idea or connects to a uh, a different theme. What I want to do is have about six to eight pre-selected themes around the around the room on easel paper, uh, thematic statements that are written. And I'm going to have my students get in mixed groups of Warriors Don't Cry and Lord of the Flies people. And I want them to, uh, to individually identify which thematic statement re- it could, could be supported by the three symbols uh, that they have in their deck. And then they're going to do so with a group as well. And so they have to, it's sort of like that idea of mixing and matching those cards and figuring out what happens when you join them with others. And then, of course, the, the next step is going to be I'm going to have them write uh, a reflective piece um, as their first blog post where they have to uh, identify these three symbols as supporting this particular thematic statement. So that's my kind of my trial and error project I, related to make writing. I really like that lesson. I, I see the differentiation and then also just the the peer help because if your students who are reading warriors don't cry or your stronger students that can and then you've automatically paired them with the students who are reading lord of the flies so you've um you've covered so many bases with that that one assignment yes. i like that and so if there's anybody who's curious about how in the world can we actually um bridge those two texts in class discussion and in this project um i didn't leave i kind of left this open-ended but both of them explore the vices of humanity uh, and obviously with the race racism um, that was part and partial to part and parcel to mm-hmm. part and partial parcel to um, the era of integration and um, the mindset of so many segregationists uh, aligns with the maliciousness of the boys who could not identify a, uh, a legitimate leader um, nor could they follow a set of rules that they all could agree with agree with and therefore you know the consequences are tragic i'm um i'm really looking forward to continuing because you know this thing that i've been doing with the blog is the first make writing assignment that i've tried and it was so very successful that i'm looking forward to continuing using these strategies teaching writing i really like her ideas about teaching argument and giving them um the freedom to figure out how that argument would best be conveyed um whether that be through you know, a commercial or an advertisement or whatever. And and it doesn't necessarily always have to be writing because we, and just in the real world, we um, communicate in so many different ways besides just essay form. Um, As a matter of fact, how often do you write an essay that's not in school? Um, Never. Probably never. So, um, you know, but people do blog. People do um, have conversations. And um, there are so many other ways to get your message across besides just writing a five paragraph essay yes and the next next closest thing that i can think of is writing proposals so if you go and become some kind of a contractor Mm -hmm. or an architect or advertiser mm -hmm, something some some position in which you would you would write a proposal and uh, or give a verbal proposal to attempt to uh, get a contract or to attempt to gain a client or uh to secure a customer in those in all of those situations you're creating an argument but for the most part many of those are verbal some of those are written even the salesperson on the sales floor at best buy is going to create an argument as to why you need the uh, the higher level inkjet printer instead of the monochrome 
$100 brother printer. Uh, so whatever ca the case may be, life is full of argumentation, but sometimes we are a little bit single-minded when We're it very, comes yes. to teaching it in our classrooms. We are, um, and, and I'm talking right now to myself about eight years ago. Um, the essay is not the golden ticket. It is not what our, we we're preparing our students for. And we've in, in the past, we have spent so much time teaching the essay. And I'm not saying the essay doesn't have its benefits, obviously, because it helps them to be able to organize their thoughts and get their thoughts together. But in the real world, that's not what they're going to have to do. Yes. And again, we're, we're talking about gr uh, gaining interest. We're talking about increasing motivation. Uh, we're talking about students finding themselves and we're, we're talking about students getting to a point where they go from, as Angela had put it, reluctant to loving writing. And I just noticed today in giving an ACT writing field test that our school had the opportunity to give our 10th graders that I have several students who wrote almost nothing mm -hmm. in, in the 40-minute time frame. That is a reluctant writer. That is somebody who one day great if they can write an essay but right now this is what angela is referring to is building that desire to write the love of writing and confidence ev eventually the stamina comes with the confidence right and um, so I'm, I'm so disheartened to see my students but do this and it was all all, all purely anecdotal note-taking obviously with the act and and non-disclosure and things like that as I walked around the room and just monitored their progress. And, and internally, uh, it's, it's a little heartbreaking to see some of those students who you can tell want to do better, but they just can't. And you just want to say, hey, try this. But you can't in that situation. And they see so many other students who are writing, and they look around the room, and they see that they don't have anything on their first page while others have already turned to the third. Yes. Um, another group of students that this could really help are the students who are good at writing, but they haven't quite found their voice. Um, there's this rubric that I use often called the QOEGV rubric, and the V is voice. And I've heard other teachers say, oh, I never give voice points. Or, um, and I've, I've myself have, been, have said, I'm really stingy with my voice points. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't be because we should be teaching our students how to find their voice. And I think that in this tinkering and getting them comfortable with playing around with their language, uh, they can find their voice. And those voice points will come a lot more easily and a lot more often. And blogs are so much fun. One of the most fun parts of it at the very beginning is coming up with the, your blog name. Oh, yeah. I had uh, anything from... Man in the Mirror, Man in mm -hmm. the Mirror, uh, who was obviously a, a student who loved Michael Jackson, Jackson to Ain't He a Chumley, <laughs> because that was a nickname uh, that I gave a student whose last name is Chumley last year. I like year. that. And I think you've got some really fun ones, what, too. Lo Logan's Pod I mean, what did it say? What was Logan's, it? Logan's Blog, blog House. house. Uh, play on words with the Log House. I thought that's pretty <laughs> funny. And uh, students, some, some students don't even know what a blog is when entering into this realm. And then the whole other discussion is some of our students don't know what a podcast is and oh, then discover yeah. how much of big nerds <laughs> that we actually are for doing what we're doing right now. But you're our audience and you're with us, so you are just as nerdy as we are, apparently. <laughs> so I think it's time now for uh, our final segment, which is hashtag... The struggle. So, Michelle, what kind of struggles have you had lately? Well, um... In the area of writing, I would say specifically the kids are not capitalizing any of the things. And um, this is a problem that I've seen get worse and worse over the last few years. And I know that there are English teachers out there saying hallelujah to me right now because it has become such a problem. And the thing is the kids know to capitalize things. It's, this is stuff like their name. This is stuff like the word I that they're not capitalizing. And so I've talked to them and said, hey, guys, listen, you're presenting yourself as someone who is an educated individual, and you're not coming across that way if you're not capitalizing any of the things. So let's pay more attention to that. And it's just such a struggle. I think they've gotten themselves in such a habit of making everything lowercase that they just don't think. 
They don't, they don't think about it because I know they know how to do it. They can fix sentences all day long, but when it comes to their own writing, they're just not capitalizing anything. Um, is that a freshman problem or are you seeing that in the 10th grade as well? I see it too. And as you were saying that, I'm just thinking about the very subtle overlap between proper English and soft skills Mm -hmm. that when students do not use proper capitalization and they know many of our students know better, they just get sloppy and careless that that carelessness is is really a soft is related to a soft skill. Professionalism is about ensuring your audience uh, respects you, that you you show that you deserve respect, and that's done through uh, the the consideration of all of those minor details, seemingly minor details, when we're writing. I just got an email a couple of days ago from a student who is a pre AP student and writes to me in all lowercase letters without punctuation and has a request for me saying something like you know I was out over the last couple days is there any work I can make up something like that and if I'm going to respond to that email which was sent around 6 30 7 or 8 o'clock at night I can't remember and if I'm going to do as I love to do which is to respond in a prompt way even at night I'm not one of those teachers who's like I only communicate and do my job between 8 and 3 every day Mm -hmm. I love to correspond with my students and be as helpful to them as possible to inspire them to work hard it's easier to do when a student shows respect and that respect is again a soft skill Mm -hmm. that is seen even through even through using proper grammar and mechanics So my hashtag, The Struggle, is only related to our last podcast episode, which had to do with crafting communication. (laughs) I was so proud of, and and, and I still am, so proud of our discussion rubric, but here lately I've been somewhat saddened by the fact that Michelle's class and another teacher, Katie Norton's class, are doing so well in their discussion. They shared, they, they invited me to their Voxer chat, and um, ever since then, theirs is full of hustle and bustle. And mine, you can see the what are those things that roll around in Western movies? The across the across tumbleweeds. The street. My mine, you can literally see tumbleweeds. I think <laughs> I think there probably could be if if students would actually tweet, not tweet, would actually post them and share them. There there should be some tumbleweeds as gifts going across the Voxer screen. Um, so. We've just had a lot of interruptions at school, and it's not the school's fault. It's life in a school system where you have testing, and you've got pep rallies, and you've got, I can't even remember the various things, but there have been things that interrupt our week to where I only have like a two-day instructional uh, period. And so those, those situations have sort of halted the success of my class discussions to the extent where I've said... Guys, let's let's not do it this week. We got too many interruptions, and I don't want it to grow stale. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to feel so rushed to get it done. Let's bump it to next week, where we have a full week, Monday through Friday, to really put 110 percent into it. And so, I'm hoping to kind of uh, give that new charge uh, in them, recharge them, to get uh, get involved in that in that really ex- exciting, thriving class discussion again. I think sometimes taking a break with something like that actually can be re-energizing for them, especially when the when the when we've had homecoming and just so much craziness going mm. on lately um, that I'm sure that they'll... Homecoming, that was it. Oh, homecoming? That was like one of the big things. Yeah, it's homecoming. Yeah, huge. that definitely interrupted the flow. Yeah, Mr. Summers, can I go downstairs and sit in the, the bleachers while five students make our homecoming float? Okay. Um, no, you may not. We've got some things to do in <laughs> class today, but thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, yeah. And you are dressed like Dwight today from uh, That was awesome. He looked spot on. I'm totally making this up. Dwight, actually, that student, he is incredible. He's, he's a hardworking student with great grades, great input in our class conversations. So don't let me mix my, <laughs> mix my message. He's, he's the strong one. It's probably somebody... I don't know, dress like the Wicked Witch from the West on that particular homecoming day. But So the, the struggle definitely has been just uh, interruptions lately and just kind of losing our flow, and we got to rev back up, right, um, as we are about, by the way, to approach fall break. All right, and you guys, too, <laughs> hopefully have a little bit of a break coming up. Yours is not probably a week long like our fall break is, but, hey, Thanksgiving's coming soon, too. 
And boy, do we have a really awesome episode next time around. I almost just want to not even tell them and make them wait because that's how amazing it is. But let's, nah, okay, give them a hint. All right. Teach like a parrot. Parrot? Is that it? Okay, yeah, maybe. Maybe. A parrot? Teach like a, that's teach like right. a parrot. Or, or a pirate. <laughs> uh, so next time around, we are going to have... The Dave Burgess. The Dave Burgess from the, or who authored Teach Like a Pirate. And so he's going to be discussing a variety of things, especially on the topic of student engagement. So he's got tons of different ideas, and we are so pumped, and he pumps us up, that, uh, that we know you're going to benefit. For, so be looking for that podcast very soon, and uh, I know you're going to like it. You're going to love it. All right. Well, thanks for listening to Episode 7, and uh, we will see you next time. See you later. Thanks so much for listening to Episode 7, Revving Up Writing. Don't forget to stop by acrossthehallpodcast.com for the show notes and join the Across the Hall conversation at hashtag XTheHall. We hope you'll join us next time when we talk to Dave Burgess, author of Teach Like a Pirate. See you next time.